Hey everyone, welcome to the first of my Ketoween, Scaroween, Terroween, Halloween celebration for the month of October. As I'd said earlier, we are going to be doing crimes that inspired horror movies. So you're going to see a video on the real life crime, then a review of the associated horror film, as well as some other really neat things that I've thrown in for this month. Uh, interviews with uh, some directors, producers, actors in horror films, as well as just some discussion on horror films in general. So you're going to be seeing a lot of that. So it's going to be fun. So I'm combining horror films and true crime. And the very first one here I'm going to do is a re-release of a video I did back in 2020 on the crimes of serial killer or mass murderer, really, John List. Now, he's the one that infamously murdered his entire family and then disappeared only to be outed by America's Most Wanted in 1989. So you're going to see that story. His story loosely inspired the horror franchise known as The Stepfather. And so the very next video will be my review of The Stepfather, which is actually, in my opinion, a good horror film. And so this is a re-release. The original version is still available on my channel, but um, I am recutting it and re-editing it for you. I hope you enjoy it. So let's dive into the story of John List. Wait a minute. Who am I here? Uh, dude, check your ID. Hey everyone, welcome back to Keto and Crime and Thought Crime. As you may have gathered from my little intro there, today we are studying the source material for this horror series, Stepfather, starring Terry O'Quinn. It was one of my favorites as a kid growing up, and still one of my favorites. Terry O'Quinn deserves an Emmy for his portrayal of the evil stepfather in that, but like all good horror movies, it does have a creepy real-life source. And today we're going to look into the life and, mur and murders of John List. One of the first family annihilators and the source material for this horror film as well as other movies, including a 1987 film on the actual case itself starring Robert Blake called Judgment Day, the John List story. And then, of course, we have the original Stepfather films in the 80s, and then there was that really piss poor remake in 2009, which I don't recommend. But anyway, let's get into it. The real life story of... John List. Johnny Mill List was born in Bay City, Michigan to parents of German descent, John Frederick List and Alma Barbara List. Grew up in a average middle class upbringing. Um, all accounts say that he was very shy at school, had a hard time fitting in really preferred the company of his family, so he spent a lot of time with his very doting mother, Alma, and she basically filled his head with the fact that he was destined for greatness. If you remember the story we did on Cybernet, um, and I'll link that here, the main, the main also had, Martin Wallace also had delusions of grandeur fed by his mother, so very, very similar there. He was also subjected to a very devout Lutheran regimen growing up. Uh, Lutheranism was the first offshoot of Catholicism after the Protestant Reformation and still held a lot of the very strict ceremonies and preparatory requirements that Catholicism required. And so he was subjected to that as well. His father was a Sunday school teacher and John aspired to be the same. So studying his catechism and catechism and his, excuse me, accent and other stuff was very important to him. And he also strived for greatness. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to be wealthy, just like he, what he presumed his father was. And by all accounts, that was his primary focus. And this was fed by his mother. 
However, by the time he was a teenager, World War II had broken out, and in 1943, John List did enlist in the United States Army, and he did uh, make it into the infantry, but he was basically put into lab duty attached to the medical corps, and he served the last two years of the war, even into 1946, as a lab technician for the Army. He was eventually discharged in 1946 and enrolled at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he earned a bachelor's degree in accounting and business administration, all the way up to a master's in accounting. So, highly educated man. And then, with the onset of the Korean War, he was actually, when the Korean War escalated in 1950, he was actually recalled into military service. I don't think a lot of people realize that, but if you've been honorably discharged and you're still within the age requirements of being in the enlisted person in the Army or for your last rank, you can actually be called back into service if ever needed, and that happened to him. He was uh, basically re re-enlisted in the Army and was actually stationed at Fort Eustis, Virginia, and there he met the woman that would become his future wife, Helen Morris Taylor, who is the widow of a, an infantry officer, a first sergeant, that was killed in action in Korea. Now, first sergeant isn't exactly an officer, but... By all accounts, they said he was an officer, but I did some digging and found that he was actually a first sergeant. So that's like tip top of the uh, enlisted ranks. So they have the same power in a battalion almost as an officer. So very close to being an officer. And he may have later on been promoted, but from everything that I saw, he was a first sergeant. But she was the wife of a killed military person that was killed in Korea, and she was already living at Force Eustis, which was their last post, with their daughter, Brenda. Now, Helen's past is pretty sad. Not only did she actually lose her husband to military service, and her daughter, her daughter Brenda, also suffered an early death, though not at the hands of her stepfather. Brenda would later marry and leave the family in 1960. I was able to locate her obituary. She actually died at the in her 50s in 1993, so still a very, very young death for Brenda as well. But Helen and her late husband also had a infant son that died at two months old, and I was able to locate some information on that as well. His uh, gravestone is located in Presidio Monterey Cemetery in California, which is where they were Station when he died, his, his name was Kenneth Everett Taylor, and he died at the age of two months in 1945, so literally just about a year before John List was originally discharged from the Army. So this was, you know, probably very, very fresh on her mind, you know, within a few years. So Helen did not have the greatest of lives. I want to put that in there because she comes into a lot of criticism later, but I just want to put it, she did not have the happiest nor best of existences up until the time before she met John. So from 50 to 51, so from 1950 to 1951, Helen and John dated casually, at least from his end. And then near the end of 1950 into mid-1951, John received notification that because of his talent in finance, he was being transferred from the Army's infantry and the lab technician post into the finance court. And that would require him being restationed in Northern California. So he was all set to ship out to a new posting and leave Helen and Brenda there where they had been living. However, for some reason, Helen felt the need to lie to John and tell him she was pregnant. And therefore, as a result of the time period we were in, John married her December 1st, 1951 in Baltimore, Maryland, which was near Northern Virginia, where they had been stationed. And from there, John, Helen, and her daughter Brenda moved to Northern California. And then he completed his second tour in the Army there in California in 1952, and he obtained work with an accounting firm in Detroit. They moved back to Michigan, and then from Detroit, very quickly, he received a job as an audit supervisor for a paper company in Kalamazoo, and it was there in Kalamazoo that the List's three children were born. John Jr., Patricia, and Frederick. 
And then from there, he moved from being the audit supervisor at the paper company to a general supervisor of the company's accounting department, but there was some issues going on at home. Helen's uh, had started to drink. Helen had started to drink a lot. Now, no one really knows why. There was also some indication that maybe she had contracted syphilis from her late husband, and that went untreated. And she was starting to exhibit a lot of symptoms of syphilis, uh, blisters, some early signs of dementia, even her eyes. And you'll notice in some of the photographs I put up, one of her eyes had actually gone cross. So they believed all of that was as a result of untreated syphilis. And so you had that creeping up. You know, you had John that by now knows that she was not originally pregnant, that that was a lie. And now all of a sudden, boom, she has syphilis may have contracted, he may have contracted, and then um, she started to drink. And this is on top of all the pressure of being an accountant and then having three children to take care of with a wife that was becoming vastly incapacitated. So um, there was a lot of trouble in the list home. And Helen became increasingly mentally unstable as a result. And then uh, about a year after that, John was changing jobs a lot. And a lot of this was accounted to the fact that he just didn't fit in in a lot of places. He was still very, how do you say, very one side, very introverted, very, didn't talk a lot, wasn't very friendly, didn't smile a lot. He was quoted as of having said uh, he was the type of guy that might mow his grass in a suit. I mean, that type of guy. So he didn't fit in very well. As a result, oftentimes he was let go. If the company's experienced any financial trouble or anything like that, he was one of the first to let be let go. So he's changed jobs a lot. And after the uh, accounting supervisor job in Kalamazoo, he relocated his entire family to upstate New York in Rochester, where he took an accounting job with the Xerox Corporation where he eventually became their director of accounting services. But then finally, in 1965, he got that long coveted executive position with a bank near in Jersey City, New Jersey. And he became a long, his long away to dream of moving into the type of life he thought he should have, that all his accounts his mother had promised him. He became a vice president of finance at this bank. And he moved his entire family, including his mother, to Westfield, New Jersey, so that he could take this job in Jersey City. But the deal is that at the urgings of his mother, Alma, and his wife, they entered into a mortgage for a 19-room Victorian mansion there in the city of Westfield, located at 431 Hillside Avenue. 19 rooms. Huge mansion. This had to probably be, you know, the equivalent of today, maybe a million dollar home. So, huge house that he knew he couldn't afford, but both his wife and his mother pushed him to go for the house, and his mother even gave him the money for the down payment and said, hey, I'm going to move in, move me in. I'll live on one of the other floors away from the rest of the family, and we'll, I'll help you make sure you keep this house. So he gave in to the pressure, many sources say, and he bought the mansion. And then in 1967, a mere two years after moving in and taking on that huge mortgage, he lost his job because the branch of his bank actually closed at Jersey City, and he was not among the ones that were transferred to other places, and now he's unemployed and has a huge mortgage payment. Now, John and his family were still devout Lutherans. They were going to the Lutheran Church there in Westfield, and among the many teachings, at least by his interpretation, was that poverty was a sin. So, he could not bear to tell his family that he had lost his job. So he started taking money from the joint checking account he shared with his mother to pay their bills. 
and he continued to get up and dress and keep his routine as if he was going to work and go to work, keeping it hidden from everyone else. Now, by this time, his wife Alma had, and his children, some of them had gotten a part-time job, so they were working, but they kept that money for themselves. I mean, that money went to, you know, extracurricular activities and just having fun, and so, you know, John was kind of left in a quandary. He would go to train stations and just hang out all day. He would go to libraries. He would go to museums, you know, free stuff, and basically act as if he was going to work, and no one really ever called the bank to check up, but as far far as everyone knew, he still had his vice president job. He did eventually land another job, but it was just as a staff accountant for a local company and didn't pay, you know, it, half of what his former job had paid. So they were still in a position where they could slip into poverty really quick and lose their house. Now, he spent a lot of time writing about this and thinking about this and he really felt that their only option was to go on welfare, and he felt in his heart of hearts that this was a sin because that's what he had been taught in the Lutheran Church, or at least that's his interpretation of what he had been taught in the Lutheran Church. Also, there was another problem. His daughter, Patricia, had expressed an, ish had expressed an interest in becoming an actress, and this to John was the same as her just saying, I don't want to go to church anymore. I'm letting the devil into my heart, the devil into my heart, so that I can go off and, and be, be an actress. He saw this as her embracing a very godless and lawless type of career, and he saw it as an indicator that his family was starting to fall off the Christian path. Add on to this, Helen was still drinking. The symptoms of her syphilis were becoming very apparent, and she stopped going to church. So he had this entire thing going on in his head that his family was slipping off the straight and narrow into oblivion, and he had to stop it. So his plan was to make sure that his family went to heaven. And to do that, he felt he had to end their lives before things got worse. He also knew that this would be a second chance for him because he didn't believe in suicide. He believed in familiacide, but he didn't believe in suicide. He could send them to heaven, but he couldn't commit suicide because if he did, he wouldn't go to heaven to be reunited with them. So he, according to his mind, said that he would be doomed to wander the earth alone. So November 9th. 1971, he put his very calculated plan into, into play by systematically murdering his entire. And why would he choose this particular weekend? Because Helen's mother was supposed to be coming to visit them because Helen was having some issues and her mother felt she could help. So his plan was to enact it when Helen's mother was there so that he could also kill Helen's mother. I guess because of the shame she would feel of what was about to happen. But luckily for Helen's mother, she was ill and decided not to come. She postponed her trip. Luckily for her. However, that morning, John Liss got up and went about his normal routine. He dressed for work. He went down and had breakfast with all three of his children. They got up. They went off to school. And then John got up as if he was going to go, go on to work. And about this time, Helen well had woken up and had came down the stairs to have her morning coffee and toast and was sitting in the kitchen. It was then that John Liss gathered his Colt 22 caliber revolver and his 9mm Steyr handgun and went into the kitchen snuck up behind Helen and shot her from the left side in the back of the head toward her left eye, killing her instantly. He then immediately rushed up to the third floor where his mother Alma's apartment was when he heard her yell, John, John, what was that? And he said, I don't know, I'm going to check it out. So he, he ran up the stairs to her apartment and burst in on her and shot her point blank facing her in the head and pretty much left her body there because her body was too heavy for him to move. He then 
made himself a sandwich, had lunch, then drug Helen's body on a sleeping bag into the ballroom of the house that was never used, left her there, moved some other sleeping bags in there for the rest of his family, and then mopped and cleaned the kitchen with paper towels and with a mop to get the blood off the floor so his other children wouldn't realize what had happened. He then waited for Patricia and Frederick, who were 16 and 13 at the time, to come home from school. They entered the house one at a time into the kitchen to put their bags down on the counter. In each one of them, he would sneak up behind them and shoot them in the back of the head. He also drug their bodies and placed them next to their mother in the ballroom. From there, he got into, he cleaned up that mess, he got into his car, he drove to the bank, cleaned out all the bank accounts, took the cash, he went to the post office. After writing, he sat in his car and wrote letters to his children's school, letting them know they were going on a trip. He wrote letters to both Helen and Patricia and John Jr.'s part-time jobs, letting them know they would be going on a trip to visit sick family in North Carolina, went to the post office, stopped the mail, and mailed those letters. He then went to the milk company and stopped the milk and newspaper, anything else that would be coming to the house. He then drove to his son John Jr.'s school and watched his son play in a soccer game. He even commented later that his son was having a very good game and seemed to be enjoying himself. He then drove his son, John Jr., home. The boy walked into the house ahead of his father, put his athletic bag down on the counter, and his father then stepped up behind him and shot him in the back of the head. However, John did not go as easily. He turned and shot, may have struck out once at his father, and then fell and continued to convulsed for a few minutes and it was because of this that John List thought he was still alive and ended up shooting him an additional nine times to make sure he was dead. He then took his body into the ballroom, laid them next to his mother, his brother, and his sister, and then from there John List sought about tidying up the house. He cleaned up all evidence of the murder. He cut him self out of all the family pictures either and to either erase himself from the family and also to make sure that police didn't have a good description of him i suppose but he did do that he then cooked and ate dinner and slept overnight he said that he had slept better than he had in months he woke up the next day did one more once around around the house packed a bag turned uh, the radio on to a Classical music station, turned on all the lights in the house, locked up, took the family car, and disappeared. Also, before he left the home that day, he wrote a five-page confession and apology letter to the local Lutheran pastor that was his pastor. And now, I have a very special guest, a very good friend of mine, Emmett from Hi, I Think I'm Real YouTube channel, which if you want a great channel that explores internet culture, some politics, but mostly internet culture and pop culture, highly recommend checking out his channel. I'm going to link it here. I'm also, I'm going to link it up here. I'm also going to link it down below. Go check out and subscribe to my buddy Emmett. He also has, also has one of the greatest voices in all of YouTube. So he has consented now to read the abridged version of John List's letter to his pastor. I'm going to insert that here, and then we'll continue on with the story. So take it away. Hi, I think I'm real. Dear Pastor Rowingle, I am sorry to add this additional burden to your work. I know that what has been done is wrong from all that I have been taught, and that any reasons that I might give will not make it right. But you are the one person that I know that, while not condoning this, will at least possibly understand why I felt that I had to do this. 1. I wasn't earning anywhere near enough to support us. Everything I tried seemed to fall to pieces. True, we could have gone bankrupt and maybe gone on welfare. 2. But that brings me to my next point. Knowing the type of location that one would have to live in, plus the environment for the children, plus the effect on them, knowing they were on welfare was just more than I thought that they could and should endure. I know they were willing to cut back, but this involved a lot more than that. 
three. With Pat being so determined to get into acting, I was also fearful as to what that might do to her continuing to be Christian. I'm sure it wouldn't have helped. Four, also with Helen not going to church, I knew that this would harm the children eventually in their attendance. I had continued to hope that she would begin to come to church soon, but when I mentioned to her that Mr. Jutz wanted to pay her an elder's call, she just blew up and said she wanted her name taken off the church rolls. Again, this could only have an adverse result for the children's continued attendance. So that is the sum of it. If any of these had been the condition, we might have pulled through, but this was just too much. At least I'm, I'm certain that all have gone to heaven now. If things had gone on, who knows if this would be the case. Of course, Mother got involved because doing what I did to my family would have been a tremendous shock to her at this age. Therefore, knowing that she is also a Christian, I felt it best that she be relieved of the troubles of this world that would have hit her. After it was all over, I said some prayers for them all, from the hymn book. That was the least that I could do. Now, for the final arrangements... Helen and the children have all agreed that they would prefer to be cremated. Please see to it that the costs are kept low. For Mother, she has a plot at the Frankenmuth Church Cemetery. Please contact Mr. Herman Shelkaz, Route 4, Vassar, Michigan 41768. He's married to a niece of mother's and knows what arrangements are to be made. She always wanted Reverend Herman Zender of Bay City to preach the sermon, but he's not well. Also, I'm leaving some letters in your care. Please send them on and add whatever comments you think appropriate. The relationships are as follows. Mrs. Lydia Meyer, mother's sister. Mrs. Ava Meyer, Helen's mother. Jean Seifert, Helen's sister. So I don't know what will happen to the books and personal things, but to the extent possible, I'd like for them to be distributed as you see fit. Some books might go to the school or church library. Originally, I had planned this for November 1st, All Saints Day, but travel arrangements were delayed. I thought it would be an appropriate day for them to get to heaven. As for me, please let me be dropped from the congregation rolls. I leave myself in the hand of God's justice and mercy. I don't doubt that he is able to help us, but apparently he saw fit not to answer my prayers the way that I hoped they would be answered. This makes me think that perhaps it was for the best as far as the children's souls are concerned. I know that many will only look at the additional years that they could have lived, but if finally they were no longer Christians, what would be gained? Also, I'm sure many will say, how could anyone do such a horrible thing? My only answer is it is an easy and was only done after much thought. Pastor, Mrs. Morris may possibly be reached at 802 Pleasant Hill Drive, Elkin, home of her sister. One other thing, it may seem cowardly to have always shot from behind, but I didn't want any of them to know even at the last second that I had to do this to them. John got hurt more because he seemed to struggle longer. The rest were immediately out of pain. John didn't consciously feel anything either. Please remember me in your prayers. I will need them, whether or not the government does its duty as it sees it. I'm only concerned with making my peace with God, and of this I am assured because of Christ dying, even for me. P.S. Mother is in the hallway, in the attic, third floor. She was too heavy to move. John. So, for a month, for an over a month, until December 7th, 1971, the house sat there undisturbed because of the letters that John List had written to part-time jobs and to schools, but finally, Patricia's drama teacher became concerned and decided to just go over to the house and and check it out. Also, neighbors had become concerned because they didn't know that, they didn't know if Alma, John's mother, had gone with them, so they were concerned because the house, all, every light in the house was on, and one by one, as the bulbs burned out, they began to go out. 
but all of them had gone up, out except for the light on the third floor, which everyone in the neighborhood knew was Alma's um, apartment. So people became concerned and started calling the police, just asking them to go do a welfare check including Patricia's drama teacher, who actually showed up to the house at the same time that the police did to do their welfare check. The police entered the very dark house. They, One of them said he had just saw the movie uh, Psycho, and the ambiance in the old mansion, the classical music playing, and then he said the only light in the house that was on was the light on the third floor which illuminated the creepy staircase just like in Psycho and so he was fairly creeped out. He said they did make their way into the ballroom and found the bodies. Now John List had turned the temperature in the house down to a very freezing 50 degrees to keep the bodies from decomposing and smelling. Once they found those they decided to do a search of the rest of the house where they did finally find Alma's body on the third floor. And of course a nationwide manhunt was called for John List. They found the family's car abandoned at JFK Airport in New York City, but no, but no evidence that John List had taken a plane. He did not appear on any plane manifests, and there was no evidence of him ever purchased having ever purchased a ticket. Um, so he had literally just disappeared. So from there, per the instructions that John List had left in his letter to the pastor. Helen and her three children were buried at the local cemetery, and Alma's body was thrown was flown back to Frank Frankenmuth, Michigan, where she was buried next to her husband in the Lutheran Cemetery. There, uh, the mansion known as Breeze Knoll remained empty for over a year, and then it was destroyed by arson. The great caveat here, and the great sense of irony here, is that there were stained glass there's a stained glass skylight in that very ballroom where he had put his family and that stained glass skylight after appraisal would have been worth a hundred thousand dollars in that money with inflation it would have been worth about six hundred and ten thousand dollars in today's money so the actual pro the actual answer to their money problems were right above their head. They just didn't know it. So perhaps none of this would have had to have happened. But what happened to John List? Let's get into that. So from New Jersey, List had taken a bus to Michigan and then on to Denver, Colorado, where in Denver, Colorado, he applied for another Social Security card under the name of Robert P. Peter Clark. He was known as Bob after that. I guess in 1971, it was really easy to get a new Social Security card. But anyway, he assumed a whole new identity. He took the name from a former college classmate of his, although the real Bob Clark, after he was found, said he barely knew Liz, so he didn't understand why Liz chose his name, but he did. He took up residence at first in a local Denver extended stay motel and also took a job at the same hotel as a cook in the restaurant and did that for several months. He then was able to get a job as a controller at a paper box manufacturer just outside Denver. From there, he moved into a house. He joined a local Lutheran con uh, congregation, ran the carpool for shut-in and elderly members, and at a church social met Dolores Miller, and he married her in 1985. In February of 1988, the two moved to Middle Othian, Virginia, just outside Richmond, still under the name of Bob Clark, and he took another job as an accountant. So, meanwhile, Police in Westfield, New Jersey, were still trying to find John List. Why? Because this was the most major crime that had happened in their, in their community in many, many years. Except for the disappearance and murder of the Lindbergh baby, this was it. So this got national attention. It was also one of the first family annihilator cases. So it definitely was one they wanted to solve. And they had launched as much of a search as they could for John List. But because he had changed his name, and that wasn't easily traceable in 1971. They had come up, come up short. So, however, enter the hit TV show, America's Most Wanted. Wanted, and 
I'm John Walsh. Tonight, we'll ask for your help with one of the Justice Department's top priority cases, and we'll re-examine a case with a million-dollar reward. But first... A Hosted by John Walsh, who was the father of Adam Walsh, a case I'm going to cover very soon, that was kidnapped and killed by a serial killer by the name of Otis Toole. He went on a crusade after the death of his son to help all missing and exploited children everywhere. He started the Center for the Miss for Missing and Exploited Children in Washington, D.C. He started the National Ch Missing Children's Clearinghouse that every state signed on to. And he has been on many, many true crime documentaries and shows trying to find trying to find criminals and bring criminals to justice. And America's Most Wanted was definitely the most successful of that. It was on the air for almost for well over 10 years and brought thousands, hundreds and thousands of criminals to justice. And the producers of the show had always said no to the story of John List because it was so old. They didn't think there was any way that they could find him because there were no pictures of John List. Remember, he took all the his face out of all the pictures in the house, and there was no way. But finally, after a lot of cajoling, talking to Walsh himself, the producers of the show agreed in 1989 to feature the case on one of their shows. And they did this thanks to forensic artist Frank Bender. And I'll, I'll put a small clip here of his work. But he did what they call aging technology. He could make plaster plaster cat, plaster face models of missing people of of like remains they had found in in fields and stuff he could make using face facial science using everything he knew about how a race should look how a certain gender should look how their families look he could actually put together very accurate masks and renderings of what a person would look like. So they actually had him construct a case of John List adding 18 years to his to his life. And he did this using pictures of John List's father so he could put in the drooping jowls and everything else. He even pinpointed List's personality with the help of a criminal psychologist of what kind of glasses John List might be wearing today, and that was dead on too. So they used this mask on America's Most Wanted. They profiled the case, and tips started coming in right and left. There was one that they really took notice of in Denver, Colorado, a lady that had lived next door to Bob Clark, who immediately recognized him as Bob Clark and said that he had moved to Virginia. Well, it wasn't but a few days after that that they did find Bob and Dolores Clark in Middleothian, Virginia. They went to the house. They asked, Dolores, where's your husband? And she said, this can't be true, but he's at work. So they went to his work. They questioned him. They ran his fingerprints. And sure enough, John List. Ironically, John List was a huge fan of America's Most Wanted and encouraged all of his friends to, to watch it because he loved the show so much. He himself says that he didn't get a chance to see his own case profile, but he said he had often wondered if they'd ever get to his case. Sounds like he was just full of himself. But anyway, April 12, 1990, List was convicted of five counts of first-degree murder. He tried to plead not guilty by virtue of insanity. That didn't work. He even said in several interviews, I feel that because of my mental state. At the time, I was unaccountable for what happened. Judge wasn't buying it. In fact, the judge on the day of sentencing said this, John Emil List is without remorse and without honor. After 18 years, 5 months, and 22 days, it's now time for the voices of Helen, Alma, Patricia, Fred Frederick, and John F. to rise from the grave. He sentenced him to five consecutive life terms in prison. He was interviewed by several, you know, media outlets after that. But I think that this was what I had to do, that I was going to go through with the whole program. That morning, after getting dressed, List walked down to the kitchen to have breakfast with his three children, Patricia, John, and Frederick. 
I tried not to act any different than I ordinarily would, you know, so they wouldn't be suspicious. Like he did on every other school day, Liszt watched them eat their meals, then rush out the door for school. After they were gone, I went out to the garage and got the guns ready. The weapons were this 9mm handgun, which had belonged to his father, and this antique 22 caliber pistol he kept as a souvenir from his war days. List's wife Helen, meanwhile, had come down to the kitchen for her morning coffee. I came back in, said a few words to Helen, and went into the front room. Then I came around back and uh, shot her in the head. List then went to his mother's third floor apartment, where she was just beginning to eat breakfast. She got over and you know, greeted me and gave me a kiss. And, I, and she said, what was that noise? At that point, I felt like a Judas having you know, kissed her too. And I said, oh, it must have been some noise out in the back. That's why I came up to see her going into the attic area. And as she got to the doorway, I killed her. List then headed downstairs to clean up the evidence of his wife's murder before the children returned home. I was very surprised at the amount of blood that you know, drained out. And I think there was some shell, shell casing you know, and some of her um, false teeth had gotten um, broken and were out on the, both the table and on the floor. I cleaned all that up. Never really showed remorse until almost the very end in a 2002 interview with Connie Chung, in which when she asked him, why didn't you just commit suicide, he confessed that he thought that would make him go to hell and he could never be reunited with his family. I don't think Chung bought it. I didn't buy it. But in any case, he died of complications from pneumonia at age 82, March 21st, 2008, in state prison in Trenton, New Jersey. His wife, Dolores, had divorced him about a year after he was arrested. So that's the story of John List and the real-life case surrounding uh, the Stepfather movies. I hope you enjoyed it. Also, a big thank shout-out to Hi, I Think I'm Real for collabing with me on this video. It meant a lot. Thank you, good sir. And please subscribe to his channel down below. Also, if you'd like to support my channel, links are down below. As always, just like, comment, share, subscribe is the best thing you can do. I appreciate it. I'll be back soon with another true crime video. Thank you so much. Till next time, Keto Comic.